Um, we have a lot of talent in Vienna. We've got people coming from, from, from around Vienna, local people, um, active in the um, technology scene, the open source scene. And our next guest is very special. <laughs> um, he's a creator of a framework that you might have heard of, the Python framework Flask. He is the VP of product at Sentry. You might have, pla uh, sorry, pla platform. Edit that out after. Uh, platform, I didn't just give you a promotion or something, or a demotion, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and um, he's, been, uh, he's, he's been a friend of Venger for a while. Like, as, as David said in his um, keynote, going through all these different changes and, and um, talks we were having over the last year, Armin has been there. He's been like, able to offer advice. We met him a, uh, a couple of months ago talked about the whole topic of licensing. I mean, has a lot of experience in, uh, on this topic. And yeah, I'm really happy that you agreed to come and share your wisdom with uh, everyone today. So please give a very warm welcome to Armin Ronacker. Yeah, uh, we, you're not amplified, so just... Um, what I'm going to talk about is how can we make it easier for people to use it. So this is an idea that it is still, for whatever reason, that common sense doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually going to do it. So this is the same with like going to the gym, lifting, whatever, brushing teeth. Um, so uh, surprisingly enough, um, despite it being common sense, it's actually surprisingly hard to actually do what I'm suggesting here, which is to fight complexity at every step. <laughs> um, and maybe a little bit like the previous talk, this unfortunately comes out of painful experience um, and haven't managed it myself. So um, this is really a rambling of routinely failing at curbing complexity along the way, but at least I'm, I got a little bit better at this. Um, so my background here is um, primarily software development. I've been doing open source for um, 20 years, basically. Um, and Almost for about the same time, I've worked uh, commercially on software, um, a little bit less, I think 16 years. And in addition to this, I do fun consulting. It's like I don't actually consult people usually, but what I do is I, I have conversations with people, like the problems that they're having. So I'm always trying to understand not just the problems that I have, but like how people are using my software, how, how people are running their businesses. Um, I have a lot of interest in this. But in the last 10 years, I have basically had a single gig, which was Sentry, it still is Sentry. Um, which is um, a company that's much larger than I thought it would be. Um, it is, just for some context here, uh, it is an error application performance monitoring tool. That's sort of what it's called. Some of you might be using it, I don't know. But um, when, when I started, we had, um, whatever, like a couple thousand requests a second. Now it's like significantly more than that. So, that, so the, the, the scale that this company has reached in the last 10 years um, is, is multiple orders of magnitude from where we started. And so a lot of my rambling here is, is actually going to be painful experience from that in particular. Um, so I'm an engineer. Engineers like to build stuff. Um, but um, what I have to force myself to accept over and over is that technology really doesn't matter. You're here to make money. And actually, I'm a very capitalistic person at heart. So this works really well for me. Um, but as an engineer, you're like, you get a lot of like individual, like on a day to day, you get a lot of kick out of like committing nice code or, or doing some, like solving a really interesting problem. And um, we like to over engineer. Um, that's, that's just an inherent thing that happens all the time. And so you, you, like one part of fighting complexity is just rec recognizing that this is really, um, you're here to make money at the end of the day. That, that's, that's the whole point of it. There, there's also an added element that it would be great to maybe create something that outlives yourself. So this is why I do a lot of open source software. Um, but I, I don't monetize that. Um, the, the, the company I work for, like the, the problems that I have on a daily basis, it's also open source, but it, is, it has a business model, right? Um, so what is this whole complexity talk? Um, the way I would see it is that complexity in a company is 
a tax on every single thing that you do. It's a tax on every pull request, it's a tax on every code change, it's a tax on every issue that you're reading, writing, and so forth. Um, so it basically that drives up the cost of anything that you're doing that is not already sort of priced in. Um, so if you, if, you, if, you, if you do a change today, and then maybe the change tomorrow is related to the change today, you don't feel it as much. But if you're trying to maneuver in a slightly different direction, then you're, you're paying this tax over and over. Um, and so the less complexity you have, the more optionality you also have to turn the ship around. And it's, it's pretty clear that not every business necessarily needs that. Um, if you are an IBM or if you are like a super large, super large company or like a hyperscaler, it is really okay to be an immovable ship because you have all the forces just push yourself through. Um, but if you're small, you, well, first of all, if you're small, you generally don't have this problem. Very often you start out, and this is how Sentry started out, nice code, nice everything, nothing went wrong. Um, but then over time, you sort of accumulate all this stuff. And this stuff that really um, slows you down. And you don't just accumulate all this stuff within sort of what the business is doing. You're, particularly open source projects are a, a prime source of accumulating more and more and more stuff, particularly if you can't say no. Um, because everybody has their own little problem that they're wanting to solve, and so you make it more flexible, you add more stuff to it, and all this flexibility they're going to ac accumulate over time adds this little bit of complexity tax everywhere. Um, and so the question really is, how much are you willing to pay for this? It has to be worth it. Um, so, how do you fight it? <coughs> and is it worth fighting? So I think it's worth fighting. Um, but the problem is you kind of, this is a ratcheting thing, which is you, once you have the complexity, you will never get rid of it. Um, there's an, I'm going to the examples later why you can actually never get rid of complexity, but this is really like, once you have it, you cannot get rid of it, or like maybe have like a window of like two weeks or not having made a release, where you can still get rid of it. Um, getting rid of complexity later on is a monumental undertaking. It very typically starts like this, um, someone starts from scratch. Um, and the problem with all of this is there's really no inflection point where it's like, okay, it was great up to this day, but then the next day it was terrible, so we found it and just walk a couple commits back and we have found the problem. So the problem is like, it's, it's a lot of these changes over time. Uh, so what is complexity? And the way I describe this is it's something that is more complex or necessary for what's appropriate. So this is very, um, <laughs> there's a lot of subtlety to this. Um, and I give you this example of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes, if you are a two people company, is a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> and, and if you are enjoying it and using it, that's great. <laughs> I really don't want to judge people. Um, and you can actually use Kubernetes responsibly. <laughs> so this is, you can microdose Kubernetes and this will work. But the problem is, Kubernetes, um, the moment you deploy it, it comes with all this great and new amazing stuff, and so it opens the Overton window of like what's, what you could do. It's like, why could I not deploy this little sidecar that like instead of me talking to a fixed IP address, I'm going to this other service where I like use some sort of like distributed consensus thing to figure out like how did it go from this role thing, and I like use Envoy to talk for it. Like, there's like all this stuff, and everybody talks about it like it's necessary to use. Um, so for a small company, Kubernetes clearly is like inappropriate complexity for the problem. But if you Google scale, then it's probably significantly better than anything you had before. Like even at Century, I would say that it was probably good payoff. Um, but if you ever deploy Kubernetes, you cannot take it away anymore. Like you have, you have overdosed on all this stuff, and it, in addition to all, all the stuff you no longer understand, it gives you also value, right? And so this is sort of, the problem is like it's unnecessary or too complicated for, for the kind of problem that you have. Um, and, and, and all of this, to, for me, like the, the strongest point here is like all of this really has to do that you never set any constraints to begin with. So if you don't have any constraints or if you're too willing to relax the constraints, then you're losing uh, by default. Um, the way this sort of surfaces, I think primarily, is you give someone a task um, if, if you work alone and you give yourself a task and, and then you sort of see the green grass over there where like, oh, this change would have been 15 minutes over there in my side project, but now I'm waiting a couple of hours for CI. Um, I, this, is, this is happening over and over and like Sentry in particular has this problem, but 
um, I can also relate to this like maybe less with like CI thing from, from open source. Getting changes through on a large open source project with a lot of people is, is really hard because if a problem once has been sufficiently unconstrained, you can no longer see how people are using it. Like, um, and I will give an example of this later, but the, the, if the code is not very narrow in what it does, and there are, I forgot what it's called, but there's a, uh, there's a term that the Go, the Go programming language uses all the time. It's basically people rely on the undocumented behavior, and so you can no longer change the undocumented behavior. A very common thing is like, you can never change your error message anymore because if you didn't give someone an API to figure out what the error is, people are going to like regular expression match this thing. Um, a couple of years ago, Postgres, you probably know this database, um, had introduced sort of transaction functionality that you can use to um, kind of try to run it. If you get a certain error, you can sort of roll back to a, a safe point and you can do some more interesting stuff from there. But there was no API to read from it. And so the, the Python driver for Postgres has all the translations for all the Postgres error messages in there so it can detect this very specific error um, because there was no, no other API to do it, right? So they can never change that message anymore without breaking code. Um, so so th the more you have of this, the harder it gets to do any change. Um, so again, it starts with the lack of constraints. Um, if you are okay in rolling out Kubernetes, then you get all that comes with it. Um, and, and I find that I could make the argument, you can set up your company in a way where you would say, um, we will only deploy, deploy Kubernetes if we have X amount of cash to burn on cloud or <laughs> X amount of people to, to, to uh, put to this problem. Um, but one of the things that you get with Kubernetes, and I really don't want to trash too much on Kubernetes, but it's just like a really good example of this. One of the things you get with Kubernetes is you get instant scopes creep. Because even if you microdose Kubernetes, you get all the jargon that comes with it. So now all of a sudden, every single conversation you're going to have with anyone is like stateful sets, um, whatever, like the different kind of load balances it can do, like control planes, data planes, all that stuff, right? So the, the me talking to you about a problem very quickly turns into, does he know what I'm talking about? Like, did he ever hear about stateful set before? Or is it just saying yes because like it would be embarrassing if you don't mention it. So there, there's a lot of this going on. Um, so I will make the argument constraints are great. Um, and there are really two forms of constraints. The first ones are the arbitrary ones. They are like um, the sugar. They stop working very quickly. You cannot really reinforce it. Uh, business constraints are much better. So if you can roll something up to something that everybody in the company believes, that's really great. Um, I, what's kind of weird is like a lot of developers feel like constraints are um, a problem. It's like if only I didn't have these constraints, I could do so much about great stuff. <laughs> um, I, I have learned that having more constraints is just infinitely better. Um, uh, and, it, and it's really just because like you're eventually going to get rid of all the constraints anyway, so it's like it will turn into the heat death of the universe um, because that is just how stuff works. But for as long as you like keep all this in place, the better it gets. And the, the thing with the business constraints is that you can hold them up very long because this is basically what drives the stuff. Like money comes in, so you believe that the money sits in relation to how you build things. So if you can roll up your engineering to business constraints, it's perfect. Uh, so here's some examples of arbitrary constraints. Pomodoro timers, probably people use that, which is if you slice it a day into like smaller chunks. Um, this is works. You can scale this up and say like this feature has to be done in two weeks and people will scale the problem according to that. But if you keep telling people like this is this release, that is this release, that is this release, eventually they're like they're just lying anyways, the deadlines are moving. Um, this just really doesn't work. Um, but for instance, like really cool business constraints that I think actually, for instance, it helped us really at Sentry is that what we said like, well, we, this is how we position this thing. So it has to be cheap because we want to go after everybody, right? So if it has to be cheap, then you better have your margins under control. So it's like there are certain things you just can naturally very easily say no to because like if you do this and everything gets 20% more expensive, it's like, yeah, you don't do that. Um, or like we, we cannot go with lawyers after everybody after they stop paying, right? Like I, I can't, they have too many customers. I can't go there and say like, well, if you send us traffic after you stop paying us, um, I'm going after, I go to courts against you. It's like, that's really not scalable. So I have to build it in a way where it doesn't harm me anymore. If you still keep sending me data, but you stop paying, right? And so that sets really clear constraints to an engineer that makes sense. Um, 
So these are just examples that sort of come from, from Sentry, but like these constraints, they have really huge ramifications too, to how you build. Um, and here's a, here's a great example, and this is sort of my recent pet peeve on complexity. Um, if you have no constraints, then initially it all looks the same. Like it doesn't look as in any way different, but over time it's sort of like the world explodes. Um, You've probably seen this, JavaScript is pretty common. There are two ways to load config files. You can either require it or you can chase and parse it. Um, looks very much the same. It's a, the same amount of code, but the, the implications are vast. Um, yeah, on, on second zero, they look the same because you haven't built any tooling around it. But then eventually, you're like, well, if the config file can write arbitrary JavaScript, then Two weeks in, someone is going to HTTP fetch from some central config store and going to do some stuff over there. And then all of a sudden I have a problem, like can my IDE still read it? Um, can I do auto completion in it? How am I going to cache it if I don't, like if there's a halting problem in there too, right? It's like, it's like I know nothing about it. Um, and people are going to use this dynamic nature all the time. And this is really, really painful. And this is, this pains me personally because I tried to write a package manager for Python and you can run arbitrary code for your metadata in Python. It's like in, in JavaScript, it's a package.json file, and anything written in there is written in there. Like my Visual Studio can read it, the README file is there, my, uh, I forgot the name of all these tools, like uh, Dependabot, everything can read this file, and we can all come into an agreement if it says version 1.0, it's version 1.0. If there's a requirements list in there, everybody's going to agree on it. That file has the version list. How does it work in Python? But well, nobody really knows because you run code all the time. And the thing with this is that a group of people, myself included, are trying to fight this very problem for like months and months. I said like, you should not do this. This is a bad idea. Nobody else is doing this. You could just not do that. But you're moving someone's cheese. People build entire infrastructures around being able to run custom stuff. Like, I really want to shell out to Git to read the current checkout so that I can version myself 1.0 plus my Git hash because like my really cool science project depends on that. So I cannot get rid of this. It's like, this is not a technical problem because technical problem is very simple. I just stop doing that, right? Um, but it's a, it's a science problem. So um, I'm busy at the end of time, so I'm going to like skip over this for the most part. But um, What's going to happen once you have all this complexity? There are two things that you can mainly Google them. One is called the inner platform effect, and one is the second system syndrome. So the first part you're going to figure out is so, so complex that someone is going to build tooling on top of your complexity. Um, and this is, the, I love this is the quote from Wikipedia, the inner platform effect is the tendency of software architects to create a system so, um, so customized as, customizable as to become a replica and often poor replica of the software development platform they're using. This is perfect because I see this all the time. It's like we have this thing, is we have Kubernetes, nobody can use Kubernetes. So what is the company doing? We're building tooling to make Kubernetes easier. And everybody hates it because the complexity is, doesn't actually go away. And like every time my tool doesn't quite do the thing underneath, I either have to poke through, for which most people no longer have permissions, or I have to go to another team trying to get them to build the tooling better. And then of course, the second part is it just declared tech bankruptcy, you give up entirely and rebuild it from scratch. And the problem with this, people again don't set any constraints. So if anything, says second system syndrome says like the second time around you're going to do this, you're going to make it even worse. Um, so you, if you don't set the constraints, it, it, it has, it's guaranteed to fail. Um, anyways, fight it early, um, keep fighting, it's worth it. Um, that's my rant. <laughs> Thank you. I, I could see so many pained expressions in the audience during parts of that talk. Um, that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs>